Hey, it's Brandon. Welcome to Transform Your Workplace. This episode is brought to you by Zenium HR. Zenium is supporting small and medium-sized organizations for all of their people processes. And right now you can sign up for the annual What People Want From Work survey for free. Link is in the show notes. Today's conversation I had with Clint Pulver, he's known as the undercover millennial where he went undercover with 181 organizations and it resulted in his new book. I love it here, how great leaders create organizations that people never want to leave. So in this conversation, we're talking about his time undercover, what questions he's asking and what he really learned about what makes an organization great. You're going to really enjoy this conversation. Very insightful. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, any of those places. I'd love to connect with you and see how you're liking the show. Have a great day. We'll talk to you next week. Clint, it is a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it, Brandon. Thank you for asking. And we're going to dive into the new book that you wrote. It's called I Love It Here, How Great Leaders Create Organizations Their People Never Want to Leave. It's a great book, and I love the way you started it. So let's talk about that. You, you visited a, a major sports retailer, and you observed that there's a huge gap between what the employer perceives. So like the, the leadership, or maybe it was one leader in particular who probably ego-driven, they think that their people love working there. But then you started talking to some employees and what they expected and what their perception was, was vastly different. And you call that the, the gap. So talk about that. Like, what did, how did that come about? How did, what did you find? Yeah, so I was a part of a mastermind group. We were out in New York City meeting with other CEOs and executives. And this one gentleman that owned the, the store was ranting and raving about all the success they had. And, uh, you know, I asked him about how they've innovated over the years and business strategy and then I asked him about his employees, and he had gone on for 30 minutes about how they had changed and adapted their business model to meet the demands of a market that's always changing. But when it came to people, he, his response was there was no need to adapt. There's no need to change. He said the way I treat people today is the same way I, I managed employees 20 years ago. And I am a millennial by age, so I'm in the younger generation per se. And I think that people are the same as they were 20 years ago, but the world they have grown up in has vastly changed, just like the market has changed. And that influences how people think and behave. And so the no need for adaptation with people was interesting to me. And so we thanked him for his time. I had 35 minutes to kill until we needed to be to the next place. And I had nothing else better to do. So I walked up to one of his employees in his store and I just, I was wearing regular clothes. I looked like a regular just customer. And I said, I'm just curious, what's it like to work here? <laughs> and the employee got super quiet, started to look around. It felt like an illegal drug exchange. <laughs> he said, <laughs> he said, dude, he's like, I can't stand it here, man. He's like, this, it's just, it's a terrible job, dude. I'm a cog in a wheel. We're all just punching a, a clock. And I, he's like, I don't even think my manager knows I'm here right now. And I was like, well, then why are you working here still? And he said, oh, I've already applied to three other places. As soon as I get a chance to bounce, I'm gone. And, I, and it just struck me. Like, it just hit me so hard that, the, again, the perception of management versus the reality of the employee experience was just off. And I thought, okay, well, maybe he's having a bad day. So I went and asked another employee and another and another. And at the end of the time that I had, I had interviewed six of his team members. And at the end of those conversations, five out of the six of his employees said they would not be working for this guy and his store in less than three and a half months. And I just, it, it really was a moment for me, Brandon, when I was like, man, what if he could know? What if the CEO actually knew? And I realized that based off of my age, and the environment that I created in just being a normal customer, employees were willing to tell me things that most employees don't write on a survey or that they, don't, they would never tell a manager face-to-face, -face, but they would tell 
a millennial. And so that was the day I started the undercover millennial program. And that was almost five years ago. And since that moment in uh, New York, I have worked with 181 organizations and I've interviewed over 10,000 employees undercover. What did you do in the undercover millennial program? Like what was the structure of that? Did CEOs, leaders bring you in to to have these conversations? Like I would love to hear the structure of that and just what you provided in terms of an output for the leaders to figure out what's going on in their organizations. Yeah, so it was across the board from CEOs, executive HR directors, uh, sometimes managers that would hear about the program and hear about what we did. A lot of these CEOs, HR, you know, they're part of SHRM, they're part of, uh, you know, a, a CEO cohort or a mastermind, and they would talk about this experience with their other people. And so that's how the word traveled, and I started doing it more and more and more because companies were realizing, okay, we've got, we want to listen to our employees. We need to know what's going on. We just don't know how to do that effectively. And by bringing me in, in a very, I almost call it sacred way because it's a fine line and there's a lot of red tape to, to, to bringing me in and making sure that this works purposefully because the goal is not to figure out who needs to be fired. The goal is not to figure out who needs to be promoted. The goal was to protect employee privacy and to make sure that, you know, we changed voices. We, cause I had hidden cameras. So, so I had, I had a pen that had a camera. I had a little lapel camera that I would use off and on. But if it was a smaller organization, I wouldn't even film because even though we're changing voices and we're blurring out employee faces, if there was a chance of somebody being identified, that, that was not the purpose of this. Again, it was just to bring to light in a, in a unique way the challenges that employees were experiencing. And they got real authentic, interesting insight that they had never received on a survey or that they never really understood at the full extent. But by bringing me in and letting me do this and creating this environment, it worked. And then my background in professional speaking and training and coaching, I was able to, to talk and entertain. And they brought me in for keynotes and events and so we've done that throughout the process of all of this and presented on the research. And now most of what I do is travel the world and present about the book and what we've done for the last five years. And all the organizations that you went undercover and did you find that there's always a, a major gap between perception by leadership and the employees or were some employers doing it pretty well? Yes. And that's what the book focuses on. I wanted the book to not be another leadership book written by a a leadership expert, I wanted it to be a leadership book written through the lens of what an employee thought when their leaders were getting it right. So that's why the title of the book is I Love It Here, How Great Leaders Created Organizations That People Never Wanted to Leave, because I wanted it to be solution-based. So that's a long way to answer your question, but the answer is yes. There were employers that, that were very aware of the problems. And when I would go in and do undercover work, those problems were the problems that the leaders were aware of. But out of the 10,000 employees that I interviewed, only 30% of those employees were satisfied. That's a really low number. It's an extremely low number. So yes, there were great leaders, but and it's sad that most of my book and my research is based off of that 30% because I didn't want to write a book where you know the title was, I hate it here. But that's the majority of what I heard. Yeah. Do you, do you think the gap between, you know, the gap that we talked about earlier between perception and reality between employer and employees, would that be the reason that would they quit as a result of that disconnect or they just disengaged? Like, what did you uncover in that? Yeah, so much of it stems back to management. I mean, if employees hated their jobs, they talked about the managers. But when employees loved their jobs, they talked about the mentors. But it, but it fell back always to management. Yes, there were pay differences. There was scheduling things. There was recognition. There was team members. But the overarching theme was always my boss. My boss. I'm quitting because of my boss. My boss. Can't stand my boss. Can't stand the manager. So management still was, was key in the high attrition that we saw. In the book, you outline several types of managers the ideal managers, the, the mentor manager. Talk about the differences between the, the managers you heard about and maybe even talked to and what an ideal state would be 
for anybody listening that's a manager or mentor? Yeah, in every organization, there's four types of managers. And those four types of managers were based off of two variables. Uh, if someone was satisfied or dissatisfied with their job, I could always trace it back to these two categories. And the first one is standards that the manager had or the expectations. And then the second is connection, the ability that that manager had to empathize and to get to the part about the employee and realize that they're a human that has a life outside of work. So standards and connection. So those are the two variables as I'll, I'll go through and explain these four types of managers briefly. The, the first manager that we found in every organization was the removed manager. So this is a manager that's low on standards. They're low on connection. So they don't really care if anybody comes in on time or if they're late productivity or they're hitting their goals. It's like, I don't know, do your job. Don't complain. Don't talk to me if you don't need to and just go to work. But they're also low on connection. They could care less about people. They're not really invested in their lives, their families, their wants, their needs, their dreams. And so what did this create in the workplace? Disengagement. This is, this is where the, the employees became removed because the managers removed. Why should I show up on time? John could care less. The, the second manager that we find was the buddy manager. So this is the manager that was low on standards, but they were high on connection. This is the manager that wanted to be everybody's friend. They wanted to be liked more than they were respected. And so they never wanted to ruffle feathers. They didn't want to take anybody off. They didn't want to, you know, make anybody feel bad. They, they just, they wanted to be the buddy. And so what did this create? It was a sense of entitlement. This is where the employees almost became more of the boss than the boss did. And it just never works. It, it, this, this sense of entitlement because you're my friend. You're the homie. You're not the manager. This is the manager that would go and play Xbox with the team members on the weekend and, and then Monday morning come in and saying, hey, we got to do better. And they're like, dude, I just saved you in Call of Duty on, on Saturday. And now all of a sudden you're, you're high and mighty. It just, it created a disconnect. The third manager was the controller. So this is the manager that's really high on expectations and standards, but they were low on connection. So this is the old command and control model of management. Put your head down, go to work. Don't complain to me. You, you want me to show you that I love you? I give you a paycheck. Okay, don't whine. You want to know how we did this 20 years ago? I'm so tired of all the millennials and this entitled work. Like, just do your job. So what did this create in the workforce? Rebellion. This is where the manager that was constantly going toe-to-toe -to -toe with every employee instead of shoulder-to-shoulder. -shoulder. And it just, it was a constant struggle, a constant battle. But the fourth manager, and this was the magic, Brandon, and it's what we call the mentor manager. And they were the manager that was high on standards. They understood that there's a job and there's responsibilities that need to be done within that job. There are expectations. But then they were equally as high on their ability to connect, to get to the part about people, to love them, to care for them, to understand them, to know that they do have a life outside of work. And what did this create in the workplace? Respect. They were not always liked, but they were respected. And they became that mentor manager, that person that, that was not necessarily a manager, they were a, a mentor. And that was another facet of the book and the research was mentorship was a key fundamental principle in significant management because mentorship had to be earned. It was never given as a title. It was something that because of who the manager was and what they were able to create and earn from that employee, they became the mentor in the role, not the manager. And it was a beautiful thing to see take place. From those that you talk to, whether employees or even the managers themselves, I don't know if you, how many managers you talk to, but did you figure out what they were doing on a regular basis that made them really fit this mentor manager role? Did you figure out like whether it's the things that they say, the questions they ask, the behaviors that they have? I'd be really curious about that. Yeah. So if, if somebody earned the right to be a mentor in, in the eyes of their employees, so you take a manager at a car dealership and they became the mentor manager, high on standards, high on connection, good retention, a, a team that was built on respect. That manager had five characteristics that we would find in every manager situation where they became a mentor. 
Like when I would walk in undercover into that car dealership and I would say, hey, what's it like to work here? And they'd say, I love it here. I, I, I love my job. I, I, you know, I love Susie. She's my manager. I love Susie. Why? And then I'd go to the next employee. You, you've worked here for 11 years. You know, would you recommend it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Susie's amazing. Susie was at another car dealership. I worked with her over there. She switched over to this dealership, and I followed her over. Like, like that type of loyalty. And then, so why? What were the characteristics? So we outlined it into five things that a mentor manager must possess to allow the mentee to invite them into their heart. And the first C is confidence. The second C is credibility. The third C is competence. The fourth C is candor. And the fifth C is caring. Five Cs, the five characteristics of mentorship. Confidence is a mindset. They were confident in who they were and their ability to help people get to where they wanted to go. Credibility was their background. Okay, you're the, you're the car manager at the dealership, but have you ever sold a car before? Did you grow up in the ranks? Do you, do you have a, a sense of what we do and why we do it? And what's your history? That establishes you as a mentor or not. So credibility must be there competence is the third C, and that's the ability to be a practitioner, not just a theorist. Stronger mentorship was always created by managers who understood how to get into the trenches and work alongside their people. Not be someone who just sat back in the office and, and managed the schedule and told people what they needed to do or harped on people when things weren't getting done. Yeah, that's what you're saying. Shoulder to shoulder, being in the trenches with them. I love that. Shoulder to shoulder. Yes. And then fourth was candor, the ability to create relationships so strong that honesty could exist. Great mem me mentors had the ability to have honest conversations. They built a relationship with the deposits of trust and the connection piece where they could go to somebody when things weren't right and have an honest conversation. And the employees talked about that, you know, the ability that when I work with Frank or when I work with Susie, like I'm getting it straight. She's not giving me fluff. She's not talking behind my back. She's an honest individual, and she treats us all with that same sense of candor. And then, and then the fifth C is, is fairly straightforward, and it's just the ability to care, to truly care for people, but to also become an advocate, not just a developer. There's a lot of managers that look at their role, whether it's in HR or, or a management-type position or even in sales, and it's like, I got to get you from point A to point B to point C. I gotta, we got to get there efficiently, effectively. We got to hit our goals. I'm going to develop you to do that. But the mentor is about advocating. It's about understanding, okay, you've got dreams, likes, wants, and desires. And it's my job to be the person that connects you to that. And when you step into that role in the life of an employee, it, it holds a whole new meaning. It holds a sense of where people voluntarily commit to be with you. They like themselves best because they're with you, because you're the advocate, not just the developer. It's powerful. It is. And let's hone in on that a little bit more. In the, in the book, you talk about creating an environment where employees can actually realize their full potential. And I think the mentor manager has a lot to do with creating this environment. So what are the things that come up for you, when you think about like what kind of environment, the, the team dynamic, the culture that allows somebody to unlock their full potential? Yeah, I, I think it comes down to, you mentioned it, potential and worth. Great mentor managers were able to communicate worth of an individual, that they were able to recognize who they were and their contributions to the organization. And, and they, they accentuated that. They saw that. They recognize that, whether that was through incentives or pay or time off or schedules or flexibility or awards or gifts or promotions or whatever. They, they, they just recognize that. And people felt seen, they felt heard, and they understood that somebody was with them. But then the, the second component was potential. The ability to, to not just say, okay, you're amazing, I see you, but to also say, this is what I see you becoming. That's a powerful piece because, Brandon, if someone's listening to this and they work in an organization, whether it's HR or they're a manager, if your people can't grow where they are at in their organization, they will go and grow somewhere else. 
And, and growing is not just an up the ladder type of a movement. You know, sometimes we think of growth as like a promotion and higher pay and moving somebody from a mid-level position to a higher level position. And it's not just that. That is a component of it. But sometimes it's just growing them as people. I remember I worked with a, a, a large dental chain uh, of, of dental clinics. And I had this beautiful manager that had just created a culture that was so powerful, high retention, people that were engaged, they were loyal, they were happy at work, they, they cared for their patients in a, in a unique way because they were cared for themselves. It was, it was a really cool thing to see. And I remember she, she told me after I had done undercover work, we're sitting there, we're debriefing, we're talking about things. And I said, one of the coolest things that everybody talked about was the program that you established. And she knew exactly what I was talking about because she said that every, every hygienist, she couldn't pay them any more money. She couldn't promote them, but she understood the value of growing people. And so she went to all of the dental hygienists and she said, we just enrolled all of you, if you're willing and wanting to, into Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. And she said, you know what, we know that some of you, you know, you've got homes, you've got mortgages, and I can't pay you more. I can't necessarily advance you in your career, but we can help you and your family get out of debt. And we can't help you pay off your home. Like, it was a beautiful thing to see how an organization understood communicating the potential, not just in, but outside of the workplace, in the lives of their people. And so that's just a little example of, of, of how somebody did that. But again, communicating worth and potential so well to the point that people see that within themselves. And if they look at your organization and go, yeah, that is the place where I feel that, and feel advocated towards that on a daily basis in a consistent way, you have just won what 80% of the workplace just doesn't provide. Exactly. One, well, going back to your five C's that you talked about earlier, that right there shows that they also care. It's not even just about work. It's about realizing their potential within their family units as well. That's right. And, 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 and I know that there's some people listening to this and they're like, well, oh, geez, I give them a paycheck. Like, can't people just do their job? Like, can't people just work? Like, why do we have to provide financial peace university? And why do we have to provide growth opportunities? Here's the thing. You don't have to do that. But those organizations that, that don't, I t I've told every one of them, then have fun being a solo entrepreneur or be okay with the revolving door of turnover and the thousands if even millions of dollars to some organizations that that costs them in turnover, loss in morale, productivity, recruitment costs. Like, like what it costs when an employee leaves your organization or even more when they disengage mentally from the workplace. They're still there. They're still on the payroll. But they, they, have, they have mentally checked out. And it's because you just, you're not doing that. And there are too many companies now that are realizing the value of treating people right and creating workplaces where people say, I love it here. And if you don't do that, then just be okay with the constant battle and the struggle that that will bring to your company and clients. In your interviews, did employees ever say anything about workload and stress levels and if you ask those questions and they, they talked about it, what, what did they say that they wanted as a result of the high workload and stress? There's a big thing now with lifestyle. Lifestyle, lifestyle, lifestyle. COVID taught us a great deal about that. And the workforce is looking a lot different today than it did in 2019. You know, people are realizing now for the first time ever, I can, I can live in Colorado and work in New York City like I used to and save twice on rent and make three times as much. Oh, and I can work from home whenever I want to as long as I get what I need done. Or, you know, we look at the, the, the five-day work week is now moving to a four-day or even a three-day work week. There is this shift for not so much life balance, but almost just lifestyle. Like, it's a lifestyle. Like, we want to cater to, yes, we still have high standards, 
We still have a product. We still have customer service. We still have marketing efforts. We still have the fundamentals of a healthy, thriving business that needs to be accomplished. But can we also provide a lifestyle for our people that reduces stress, that allows you to be a better parent, that allows you to be home, that allows you to go fishing if you want, that allows you to take a vacation when you want to take a vacation? Like those thought processes are happening more and more, even more so than they did in 2019 because of COVID, but also because, I mean, right now, companies are struggling to hire people. A lot of companies furloughed people, they laid people off, and employees remember how they were treated during COVID. We've done research during the pandemic, and that is a trending discussion. The second trending thing is, again, they've had time to think. You know, I'm stressed out of my mind. Is this really where I want to be? And now the marketplace has shifted and organizations are looking, actively looking. Most are looking for more people as things ramp back up. And so it's just, it's just changed the landscape very quickly. And again, if we're not thinking about how to provide that lifestyle, too many companies are and you become irrelevant if you don't. Exactly. Which brings me actually to the next question I wanted to ask you about the status interview. What questions do you ask in the status interview? How do you recommend leaders use it? Yeah, I'd be curious to see what you have to say about that. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a a really important key aspect. And most employers aren't doing this the way that it should be done. And it's just checking the status of the employee. You've heard that age old adage, Brad, and if you feed a man a fish, then you feed him for a day. But if you can teach a man to fish, then you feed him for a lifetime. Every time I hear that, I, I say, who said the guy wanted a fish? (laughs) <laughs> like maybe he's a state guy maybe he'd like a chicken you gotta ask the question though that's the, that's the key. you gotta ask the question and so far too often so many employers go yeah i feel like we know what our employees want and and it's just it's so off they've never taken the time to individually ask people and create an environment where people could be heard so we recommend the status interview and making this a little bit more relevant to right now, I would, I would ask somebody if they're listening to this to look at the people in your organization right now that you could not lose. Like if they left tomorrow, your company would be in a hard spot. And I would recommend you create a moment with that individual. You call them into your office. It could be informal. It could be over Zoom. It could be on a walk. It's in any situation that you want it to be. And you start the conversation with vocal praise. You sit down with the employee and you go, listen, John, Jack, Judy, whoever it is, we appreciate you. We see what you do. We understand the value that you bring to the organization. Take a moment and just praise them. And then ask them one of three questions. Well, the first of three questions. Number one is what can I do as your manager to keep you here? We need you in this organization. And I just want to know what I can do to keep you here. What's getting in the way? What's preventing you from being successful? What, what, you know, what, what, what do you need? I just, I want to know what I can do to keep you here. And some managers are afraid to ask that question. Because they're like, well, what if, what if the employee asks for a 20% increase in pay and a corner office and ski passes? And I can't do that. Then it gives you the chance to then look for variables. Look for other opportunities. Okay, well, we can't pay you more, but maybe we can work on your schedule. Or maybe we can still allow you to do this or that. You don't know until you ask. And if you can't reach anything, uh, at least you asked. So start there. What can we do to keep you here? The second question is what's getting in the way of your success at work? What's getting in the way of your happiness? What's getting in the way of you thriving in this job? Is it a coworker? Is it me? Is it the, the pay? Is it the, the skit? What is it? And then the third question is what can I do as your manager to help you get there? Again, putting you back into the role of the advocate, the mentor, not the manager. Those three questions, very simple, but it is amazing when you create a moment like that with your employee, what they will tell you. It's very simple, but incredibly effective. Yeah, something you just said, which is my biggest takeaway from that is like, you don't know unless you ask. And I think too often we are afraid to ask because we don't know what the answer is going to be. But how do you improve if you don't figure out what people want? Do you know when, Brandon, most of the time when those questions are asked is in the exit interview? 
on the exit interview. Yeah, it's too late. It's too late. Yeah. 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 And it's like, you should have asked this six months ago. I want to end the conversation with this. I pulled out a quote that I, I loved, and I thought it wrapped up the the content of this book, but it also expands on a little bit more. So the quote says, it's not just about getting your employees to say, I love it here. It's also about getting them to say, I love who I am while I'm here, end quote. How do people, how do leaders support that? That's, um, you know, now as we talk about work-life integration, it's it's truly not just about the work anymore. It's about like who we are. Can I be who I am at home the same way I'm at work? Like people want to bring their whole selves to work and how do we create an environment and support network that allows them to to love who they are? Yeah, I focus on it a lot in the last chapter. And, you know, when employees talked about places that they loved to work when they would honestly and genuinely authentically tell me that and they lived it and they had no plans of leaving and they were truly loving their jobs but loving who they were while they were at their jobs I narrowed it down to the three P's passion purpose and the ability to provide and some people listen to that and they're like, oh, geez, what, more intangible, soft skills, like this motivational per, passion. Per, but that is it. Like that is it. They, these workplaces hired people, first off, they, they put the right people in the right places within the organization that could play to their passions. And they advocated to that. Uh, using and uh, allowing people to do on a daily basis the things that, turn, that pulled on their heartstrings. The things that they just were enthralled with or they loved or they were excited about, whether it was people or sales or the, the, the tech or the product or the software or the team members, or the, the, that, that, all of those things contribute to, again, doing something that you are actively passionate about. And then the second piece was the ability to provide. Can people actually put a little way in savings by working at your company? Or are they just living paycheck to paycheck? Are you competitive in your wages? Are you competitive in your incentives? Are you competitive in, again, helping people to provide in a way that's sufficient for them? And every company is going to be different in how that looks and feels. But if people can't do that, it affects their, it affects their lives. It affects their families. It affects all the things. And yeah, and then that third piece is purpose. You know, allowing people to do something bigger than themselves allowing people to feel a sense of significance in their job, not just success. And that comes down to the story that you, you allow them to write, the story that you bring them into in the organization, the story as an organization that you're writing as a whole for the customer. It comes down to a lot of different variables, but those are the overarching themes. Passion, the ability to provide, and purpose. If you can do that, you create a workplace where people have a higher ability uh, to say, I love it here, and to say, I love who I am while I'm here. And when you create that, you create stronger influence, retention, loyalty, productivity, and an empowered workforce. And that always creates greater productivity. That always creates better efficiency. and that's what I wrap it up into. Clint Pulver, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. Uh, loved your book. The book is I Love It Here, How Great Leaders Create Organizations. Their people never want to leave. I encourage people to go check it out, grab it. It's probably on Amazon and other places. What do you want to point people to or, or share with the audience while we wrap up? Yeah, yeah. They can check out the book. It's on Amazon. They can check out the website, Clint Pulver. Dot com. I just, the last thing I would maybe say, Brandon, just as a closing remark, is to remind everybody that if you are an employer, if you are a manager, an HR director, whatever it is, if you work with people, even a parent, or you're, you're, you're married, or you have a spouse or a partner, just remember the, the significance that you have in writing the story in other people's lives. You are a masterful storyteller, not in the story you tell, but in the story you help others to write. And you have a chance to help people live, not just exist and to create an opportunity where people do like themselves best when they're with you. And we need more of that. And when managers were reminded of that, when people could make that connection and remember and understand 
that their job in leadership had the capacity to do that, to be somebody that was never forgotten, to be somebody that truly became significant in the lives of others, not just someone who was successful. It's a powerful thing. And again, it, yeah, it's not about being the best in the world. It's about being the best for the world. And when we live that way and we try to treat others that way, it's, it's just, I don't know, it, you, you write better stories. You create moments that last. Beautifully said. Clint, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Brandon.